Hello and welcome to Insight of Thermology. This is Dr. Amrit, welcoming to you to another lecture in the Uveitis series. Today we are studying two important white dot syndromes, the multiple evanescent white dot syndrome versus the acute posterior multifocal pigment placoid epitheliopathy. So what are these white dot syndrome? The white dot syndromes basically are a group of idiopathic inflammatory multifocal disorders which involve the posterior segment. Idiopathic means that we still do not understand, understand these white dot syndromes completely. By posterior segment, I mean that they involve the outer retina, the retinal pigment epithelium and the choroid. And these disorders are quite rare and they are usually of transient nature and they do not cause a long term visual handicap. Since they involve the posterior segment, they form an important uh, chunk of the posterior uveitis. So let us now first enumerate the various white dot syndromes. In white dot syndromes, we have the multiple evanescent white dot syndrome, also called the mutes. Then we have a bigger named white dot syndrome, that is acute posterior multifocal placoid pigment epitheliopathy, which is abbreviated as APMPPE. Then we have birdshot chorioretinopathy. Then one more is punctate inner choroidopathy, serpiginous choroidopathy, multifocal choroiditis and panuveitis, and subretinal fibrosis and uveitis. For the purpose of this video, we shall be limiting ourselves to the multiple evanescent white dot syndrome that is mutes and the APM PPE. Before we proceed to the mutes, that is the multiple evanescent white dot syndrome, I would like to tell you that many cases of uveitis, especially the multifocal choroiditis, the APM PPE and the mutes, okay, they're usually associated with a viral etiology. So what happens is that the patient, con uh, patient actually gets a viral disease and following which uh, he develops uveitis. First, let us talk about the multiple evanescent white dot syndrome, also referred to as the mutes. So what is this mute? Mutes, in mutes basically you will see multiple small, that means they're too small, 100 to 200 micrometers discrete whitish color lesions which will be actually located at the deeper uh, level of the retina and the retinal pigment epithelium. As you can see in the diagram as well, these white small discrete lesions are going to start in the posterior segment and then they are going to progress towards the mid periphery. They can concentrate around the perifoveal region but they actually spare the central foveal region. However, what you can see in the central foveal region is a granular appearance and this granular appearance is because of those tiny white or orange specks sometimes that you can see and these tiny specks which are present in the foveal region will actually be quite smaller compared to the multiple small lesions that you see uh, around the fovea and in the mid periphery. So if you have to remember two things from this slide, remember that mutes basically has multiple small discrete white lesions and along with that in the fovea there will be a granular appearance. So let us see this fundus picture. Here you can see these whitish color lesions, right? And they're quite small compared to the disc. The disc size, as we know, is about 1500 micrometers. And these lesions, if you see, they're quite small compared to the disc. And the size is actually 100 to 200 micrometers. Now here in the first picture, what you can see is this orange color granularity. Okay, and in the second picture, again, you can make out these small whitish color lesions. And if you would actually compare this to the retinitis lecture, the retinitis lesions were too bright white or they were too uh, brightish yellow in color. Whereas, as I told you that the choroidal lesions will be slightly fainter because they are present on a deeper level. Similarly, here also in mutes, which is a type of posterior uveitis and which is a type of choroiditis, so here also the lesions are slightly faint in color because the uh, they affect the deeper retina and the choroid. Now the question that you might ask is why it is called evanescent. Now this disease is called evanescent syndrome because the whitish lesions and the macular granularity that you see it will actually fade with time. 
okay it usually takes about two to six weeks to fade however you might be left with subtle rpe alterations now who is affected with mutes mutes basically affects the young females and the age of these females will be between 10 to 47 years of age and usually there's an association with myopic females and the patient is going to come with uh, acute painless unilateral blurring of vision and this blurring will be of 6 by 9 to 6 by 60 and sometimes they will also complain about photopsias and many of patients will complain uh, about floaters and even scotomas in their vision obviously because the uh, white dots are actually present in the posterior segment so it's quite obvious for the patient to actually develop scotomas as well Coming to the investigations in mute. So what all investigations can we do? First of all is the OCTs. And what do you see in OCT? Here in OCT, you are going to see that mutes basically affects the photoreceptors and the RPE. In the photoreceptors, to be particular, it affects the inner segment and the outer segment junction of the photoreceptors. And there will be actually disruption of the inner segment, outer segment junction, which is also called the ellipsoid zone. Now, in this OCT, you can actually make out that ISOS disruption. So look at the uh, part of the outer retina within these circles. Okay, so you can make that make out that the internal, uh, sorry, the ISOS junction actually is present till here and here and then there's actually a deficiency in this region. Similarly, the RP also seems to be blurred in this area. Similarly, you can see here the ISOS junction or the ellipsoid zone is affected. Here also the ellipsoid zone is affected. And as I told you that these lesions are actually evanescent, that means they do heal. So you can see the ISOS junction is healing. However, there is some mild uh, irregularity which is still present. Coming to the fundus fluorescent angiography. So what are you going to see on an FFA in mute patient? Now in FA, in the early phase of fundus fluorescent angiography, you're going to see early punctate that is dot like hyperfluorescence. And these punctate hyperfluorescence will happen in a form of a wreath. Okay, so there'll be a wreath like pattern of early punctate hyperfluorescence in the fundus fluorescent angiography in the early phase of the fundus fluorescent angiography and in the late phase of fundus fluorescent angiography you are going to see staining that is again hyperfluorescence of these white dots so these this is a very important point to remember this hyperfluorescence is basically because of the dilated microcirculation in the deep retinal capillary plexus and also in the middle retinal capillary plexus sometimes obviously you can also see some amount of optic nerve staining and the retinal vascular sheath now, as you can see in this first picture, you can see so many of uh, these whitish punctate hyperfluorescent areas. Similarly here, this is what is seen in the early phase. And in the late phase, whatever those white lesions are there, they're going to get be better filled up. Okay, so if you have a lesion like this, you're going to see these punctate lesions around, these punctate hyperfluorescence around this lesion in the early phase. And later, the entire lesion is going to get filled up because of the staining, right? So what is this wreath sign? Wreath sign is nothing but this punctate hyperfluorescence, if you see, it is actually concentrated around the boundary of that dot lesion, white dot lesion, in a form of this wreath, okay? And therefore, this is called the wreath sign so what do you see on ffa in mutes you see early hyperfluorescence followed by late hyperfluorescence also okay so that's a very important early hyper followed by late hyper what do you see on endocyanin uh, green angiography? As you know that the ICG basically tells you regarding the choroidal circulation. And since the choroiditis or since this white dot syndromes are also a disease of the choroid, some amount of choroidal circulation is going to get affected. The choroid is going to get affected and therefore you will not see a good uh, sinusins um, in case of ICGA in mute. So in ICGA, you're going to see this hyposin uh, sinusin spots, okay? And sometimes these will, these will be much more numerous than what you actually see on the clinical fundus examination.
what about the fundus autofluorescence now the fundus autofluorescence basically tells you about the rpe health okay we know that the rpe basically consists of the uh, the lipofusion pigment which is basically responsible for this autofluorescence and what happens is whenever the rpe is unhealthy or sick the pigments are going to increase in their number okay and as the pigments increase the autofluorescence will also increase and therefore in choroiditis or in active lesions of uh, nudes also you will have hyper autofluorescence corresponding to the macular lesions which are visible during the active inflammation so sometimes what happens is that you know the patient has nudes but you don't actually find the lesions what you see in that patient is only mild amount of foveal granularity so in those cases you can actually use this fundus autofluorescence to find out if there's any activity subclinical activity uh, present in these patients Again, this picture actually shows you that these are the lesions which are present and these are, if you do an autofluorescence, the lesions become quite more prominent because of the autofluorescence pattern. Now, these two pictures are actually a contrast between ICGA and the fundus autofluorescence. As I told you that on ICGA, the lesions are going to look black in color because of the hyposinescence. Whereas on fundus autofluorescence, the same lesion is going to look darker, uh, sorry, it is going to look hyper autofluorescence. What about the visual fields? If you do visual fields in these patients, the blind spot will commonly be enlarged because these lesions can actually be concentrated around the optic disc as well. And about ERG, we know that the A wave in the ERG is actually coming from the RPE and the outer retina and particularly the photoreceptors. And since in these white dot syndromes, as I told you that basically the outer retina and the retinal pigment epithelium is primarily getting affected, ERG is going to show reduced A-wave amplitudes. What about the treatment of mutes? As I told you that it's basically a self-limiting disorder. There's generally not, no treatment required because the signs and symptoms will start to resolve on their own. So basically you need to reassure the patient. Most cases will resolve by two to six weeks. The next entity that we will discuss now is the APM. PPE. So it is acute, that means the symptoms are acute. Posterior, it involves a posterior segment. Multifocal, multiple areas of the retina are involved. Placoid, with placoid lesions. Pigmented epitheliopathy, that means the RPE is affected. So that was just a gist of APM PPE. Clinically, what you see is this APM PPE was actually a term coined by GAS in 1968. And he described a syndrome in which multiple large plaque-like lesions were present at the level of the RPE. And these lesions, as you can see, I have drawn here. These are not up to, uh, per the scale, but obviously you can see they're quite large lesions uh, compared to the lesions that we saw in mutes. Here the patient usually will be younger patient, but there will not be any sex uh, predominance. That means you don't have these seen in, um, I mean, like in mutes, we saw that it basically affected the younger females and the myopic females. But here it affects both the genders equally. Of course, a viral prodrome is usually present. So, mutes was unilateral. However, APM PPE is a bilateral condition which can occur simultaneously in both the eyes or sometimes one eye can get affected and then sequentially the other eye can get affected. What you're going to see is this creamy colored yellowish or whitish color or you can say cream colored plaques at the level of the retinal pigment epithelium. They're going to be deeper lesions as you can make out here. The vessels are crossing on top of these lesions. So that means we're not dealing with retinitis, we're dealing with choroiditis and these lesions are quite bigger Almost they can be more than half disc diameter. They can vary in their size. Their uh, markings are usually clear defined. And these placoid lesions also start appearing in the posterior segment. That means in the macula first. And then they start progressing more peripherally. However, they never uh, cross beyond the equator. What about the symptoms? Usually, as the name suggests, the patient presents to you acutely or subacutely with a painless decrease in vision. There's usually no pain associated with this white dot syndrome. And of course, the patient will have uh, scotomas, flashes of light, and the fellow eye will get affected within a few days or weeks. One important symptom that I want you to remember is headache and neurological symptoms, okay? 
So whenever a patient with APM PPE actually comes with neurological symptoms, you have to rule out cerebral vasculitis. So that is one important point that we should all never forget. And such patients actually uh, can actually come with headache even um, after many months after the ocular disease onset. APM PPE and MUDES also for that matter can have mild amount of anterior inflammation and vitritis as well. Now, what is the pathogenesis of this APM PPE? Now, one hypothesis is that it is actually the cell-mediated immunity to the viral antigens. And another school of thought says that it is because of the choroidal hypoperfusion. So basically, now what happens is that there is some sort of inflammation going on in the choroid capillaries and in the choroid, because of which the blood supply through the choroid is decreased, leads to hypoperfusion, and that hyperperfusion is finally causing ischemia and decreased blood supply to the retinal pigment epithelium and the photoreceptors. Now, we know that the outer layers of the retina from the outer nuclear layer is basically supplied from the choriocapillaries. And if there's a hyperperfusion in that zone, definitely the outer retina is going to get involved. Now, this APM PPP is usually seen in healthy people. However, there have been case reports where they have found that this disease can be associated with significant vasculitis components. So you can have venous granulomatosis and scleritis associated with similar lesions and sometimes even cerebral vasculitis. And here patients will actually come to you with uh, neurological symptoms and these patients are quite prone to developing stroke as well. Erythema nodosum and other systemic manifestation of vasculitis can be seen. And there are two diseases that you should always rule out before you actually make a diagnosis of APM PPP. And these are the sarcoidosis and tuberculosis. Because the lesions of sarcoid and tuberculosis are quite similar to that of this APM PPE. Coming to other associations, HLA-B7 and HLA-DR2. These are two important associations which are found. Coming to resolution, do they resolve? Yes, the fundus lesion do resolve, they lose their creamy color. But what happens is at one particular time frame, you can actually see both the lesions. You can see new lesions coming up and the old lesions resolving. And when the old lesions resolve, they actually leave some amount of residual RP, stippling or mottling and sometimes even depigmentation. However, there is a subset of patients where the symptoms can actually recur. And there are some 25% um, of the patients where the visual recovery is actually limited and that's because the RP and the photoreceptor damage here is much more compared to what we see in mutes and therefore the visual recovery is limited. How do we investigate for this disease? So always make sure that the alternative diagnoses have been excluded. Then we go for the macular OCT. We can do an FFA, an ICG, a fundus autofluorescence and in certain selected patients with neurological symptoms, we have to go for CNS imaging and even for lumbar puncture for the CSF analysis. And usually what we find in suspected cases of cerebral vasculitis is we will find this multifocal white lesions on MRI and CSF pleocytosis. Let us now see what do we find on OCT in case of APM PPE. In the acute phase, you are going to see hyperreflectivity in the outer layers of the retina. Right, since the choro capillaries are you know, actually there's hypoperfusion in the outer layer of retina because of the inflammation of the choro capillaries, and therefore you're going to see the outer layers are going to get affected. So, in particular, it is the outer nuclear layer and the layers outer to that. However, sometimes uh, you will actually find these uh, intraretinal fluid and subretinal fluid, which are basically atypical OCT findings, which are not seen commonly. So here, as you can see, there's the hyperreflectivity, as you can see, these are marked with this yellow color arrows. And here you can see not just the, uh, this one is the outer uh, nuclear layer. So all the layers external to the outer nuclear layer are actually affected by this hyperreflectivity, which is nothing but it is multifocal disruptions of the um, ISOS junction, lepsoid zone, external limiting membrane and the RPE as well. These similarly in this OCT picture also you can see the hyperreflectivity and also some sort of attenuation you can see in these layers okay within the circles. Now this picture here actually shows you the atypical case of APM PPE where you can see the subretinal fluid, there's intraretinal fluid. This can actually uh, resemble a VKH syndrome as well. Now 
what do you see on an FFA, that is fundus fluorescent angiography? Here, what will happen in the acute phase is that those active cream colored lesions, the placoid lesions, they are actually going to block the underlying choroidal fluorescence in the early phases of the angiogram. And therefore, in the early phases of angiogram, you will see hypofluorescence. And then the lesions are going to get filled up because of staining and therefore there will be hyperfluorescence, right? So here, in contrast to the mutes, you are going to see hypo first followed by hyperfluorescence. And of course, later on, the RPE will get atrophied. So you're going to see hyperfluorescence because of the window defect or the transmission defect through the atrophy of the RPE. So here you can see that in the first picture, there are these hypofluorescent patches, okay, which are nothing but the lesions when they are blocking the underlying choroidal fluorescence. And later on, the same lesions are getting filled up and there is hypo, hyperfluorescence. Again, in this first picture, you can see these placoid lesions and you can see the early hypofluorescence on FFA. Similarly, here, the placoid lesions are corresponding to the hypofluorescence in the early phase of the FFA because of the blocking of the choroidal fluorescence. On ICGA, obviously, as I told you, in choroiditis, it is the choroid which gets affected. So you will see hyposinuscent lesions. Now, this table actually differentiates between the APM PPE and mutes based on FA and OCT. In FA, I told you that in APM PPE, you see early hypofluorescence and late hyperfluorescence. Okay, that's because of staining. And later on, you will see the window defect. Whereas in mutes, you will see early hyper and also late hyperfluorescence. And the early hyperfluorescence will be actually in the form of a wreath. In OCT in APM PPE, you are going to see hyperreflective area above the level of RPE and with disruption of the uh, external limiting membrane, ellipsoid zone and all of this is going to correspond to the placoid lesion and very rarely you are going to see subretinal and intraretinal fluid. Whereas in mutes, the irregularity is focal irregularity. It is not as extensive as that of the APM PPE. Now, this picture actually summarizes all the investigations. So, uh, this is from the search gate. You can see in the first picture, you can see this nice placoid lesions. These placoid lesions, again, in the second picture in the Indocyne in green, you can see how hyposinuscent they look like. And the third and the fourth picture, the C and D, are actually the octa images, right? So, as I told you, some sort of a uh, hypoperfusion actually happens in the corocapillary levels in this APM PPE. So in the octa slab on the corocapillary slab, you can actually see this uh, hypoperfusion. Okay. Now in the fundus autofluorescence, again, because it's an active disease, the RP is unhealthy or sick. There's more amount of lipofusion. So there's more amount of fundus autofluorescence. Coming to treatment. Treatment is usually not required. However, if the person is too symptomatic, you can consider giving steroids, especially to those who have macular involvement. And for patients who have cerebral vasculitis or who have neurological symptoms, they should be investigated properly. And usually steroids and uh, severe, or, or what do you say, extensive immunosuppression is usually needed for such patients. So that's all for today. Thank you and have a nice day.